Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Amen. Hear these words again from our epistle from James. James wrote, Elijah was as human as we are, yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. This is the word of the Lord. We're talking about Elijah today. We've been in a series about heroes of the faith, and today it is Elijah. We've done a whole bunch of others. What are heroes? They're people who are ordinary like us. It says Elijah was an ordinary guy, but yet they were extraordinary. And it, the power was not resident in them. The power was resident in the God upon whom they called and lived. That's what changed the whole equation. One of the things we're hoping to do through this series is get you to read the old, old stories of the faith. This week it's Elijah. Next week it's Daniel. And uh, to help with that, I'm trying to encourage you to either read more of the story of Elijah or next week prepare for Daniel. But I had a test for other services. For the sake of time, I'm going to give you just one test question in this service. If Tim would set up slide six. Slide six is, with respect to Elijah, Elijah was a man of prayer, and Elijah is rarely mentioned in the New Testament. Is that true or false? It's false. Wasn't Elijah a man of prayer? Yes, he absolutely was. He prayed and a dead young boy was raised from the dead. He prayed and rain came and fire came from heaven. But the second part of the question is he's rarely mentioned, kind of a trick question. He's mentioned 29 times in the New Testament. He's mentioned in the Gospels, he's mentioned in Romans, he's mentioned, as we heard, in James. And some would think that he's kind of hinted at in Revelation, too, because there's one thing that's really unusual about Elijah, besides being a man of prayer, he never died. He was taken up in a whirlwind with fiery chariots from God, it says, and he lived a marvelous life. I want to read from you a couple quotes, and then I'll talk more about the power of prayer and how we see that in Elijah's life. A missionary who had spent several years in Japan returned back to the United States. Someone asked her what impressed her most about the churches in the States. She came back, and what did she see? Her response was immediate. The lack of agonizing prayer, she said. She pointed out that in Japan, where Christians are so greatly outnumbered, where there's limited resources, where the bulk of the people are indifferent to the faith, if not actually hostile to the Christian message, Christians know they can't impress the people with the size and wealth of their churches. They have to depend upon God for their victories. So what do they do? They besiege the God of heaven with their prayers. Often, their prayers are answered in miraculous ways. So she says, most churches in the United States need more prayer power, more times when people gather together to pray, more people who pray believing that God hears and answers prayer. But often, we don't pray, do we? We're too busy to pray, and therefore, we're too busy to have the power that God wants in our lives. We have a lot of activity, but we accomplish little. But I'm here to say to you today, not to condemn, to encourage, because God is doing amazing things in our church. This very week, we had an answer to prayer. We've been praying for years for God to raise up more people to pray, to pray about the ministry of the church, to pray for the school. And this week, we had an email that came in. Listen to what it says. 
I've been consumed with the idea of an ongoing intercessory prayer group, prayer initiative for our school. He goes on to talk about what that would entail. This thing has been on my mind day and night for three weeks without any clear action items from God. But I've been praying, my small group has been praying. And yesterday on the way home from work, I was flooded with a clear vision of what getting people together to pray for Trinity Lutheran School might look like. And indeed, we need the prayers of God's people. We need to evidence the power that Elijah had in his ministry. It all starts in Israel. What you have to understand, it happens right after um, you had David, you had Solomon, you had a united kingdom. And remember the kingdom split. You had the northern kingdom, Israel, and the southern kingdom, Judah. They had different kings. It was, it was like a split in the land. Ten tribes up north, two down south. The tribes up north began following other gods. They set up alternative places of worship. One of those places would have been Mount Carmel, offering sacrifices up there. So I want to show you what kind of that area looks like. Here you have the brook Kishon. It's at the base of Mount Carmel. Elijah had some activity. It's not a river, it's a little creek. But up above it, you have Mount Carmel. It's about 2,000 feet high, roughly. Again, what you have to know about it, it was the center of Baal activity. It goes like 12 miles or so. It goes from the Mediterranean Sea, kind of juts into the land. And you'll see a picture shortly about what that land is, is like. This is a picture from the valley looking up to Mount Carmel. It was normal in those days for there to be sacrifices up on the hilltops. They, people felt like they were closer to the gods. Well, this is a picture I want you to focus on a little bit more. What do you see? I know it might be hard in the back. You stand on Mount Carmel, you look down in the Jezreel Valley, and you see what? Farms. Farms. Now, let me ask you this. How do crops grow? Sunshine. Water. No water, no crops, no food. So Elijah goes to the king of the day because he was engaged in idolatry, a lot of it due to the influence in that case of his wife, who was a Phoenician woman who followed all these other gods they're engaged in spiritual compromise. They're to hold to the one true God, and instead, they're just, oh, whatever God you have, just throw it on the pile, it's okay. All the gods are the same, there's no difference. Just believe in some God and everything will be okay. If there's ever a story in the Bible that teaches us that's a bunch of bunk, it's this story. We'll unpack it shortly. But you have the valley and you have Elijah the prophet, the one who speaks for God, and God backs him up with miracles in his life. He's going to do a whole bunch of them. Well, here's what it says. A little bit earlier in verse 21 of chapter 18 of Kings, it says, Elijah stood in front of the people, said, how much longer will you waver? How much longer will you sit on the fence between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. That's the question. It remains the question today. Is your God money? Is your God power? Is your God success? And then the true God calls from heaven and says, wait a minute, who's God here? Who will help you? Who will save you? Who will get you safely to eternity? So what it sets up is this great battle, a dramatic contest on Mount Carmel. It was a garden place. It was a place of vineyards. Elijah called the prophets of Baal and King Ahab to come to that mountaintop. And he said this, you set up an altar, I'll set up an altar. And here's, here's the response. 
You call in the name of your God, I'll call in the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. That was the simple test, that God would just come down, set fire to this wood. The people agreed to that, to that request. The story continues. Usual time for offering was the evening sacrifice. Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed. Now what you have to understand is before this, you had the prophets of Baal, they had the first dibs on winning the battle. What you have to understand is, again, Mount Carmel was the home turf for the Baals. They had Baals all over the place up there. They tried and tried. They called out to their God. They did it from morning till noon. No answer, no response. Elijah at about noontime says, ha, huh, is your God sleeping? What's the problem? Isn't your God alive? Can't he help you? And what do they do? They try harder and harder and harder. Does it do any good? No, because they're calling upon the dead God, the God that isn't real, that can't answer prayer, that can't show forth in power. <coughs> they continue on through the whole afternoon. They end up cutting themselves, thinking that's going to placate or please their God so that he might answer. The end result is their prayer isn't answered. So here's the first point. First point is there's power in your prayer when you pray to the true and living God. You see, unless you pray to the right God, your prayers will not be answered. Oh, God is incredibly gracious, but it's kind of like this. This is a simple way I show people about answered prayer. Do a spiritual connection seminar, it's called. It's about how you can pray in your life. Wherever you are in your prayer life, how can you grow in it? I use this illustration. I have an envelope. Right now, there's no address on it. If I put it in the mailbox, where does it go? Who knows? Probably garbage. They throw it out. Okay, let's say it's supposed to get to Trinity Lutheran Church. But instead, I address it to, you know, the South Pole. Wherever I address it to is maybe, maybe where it goes. In terms of God, if we don't have the right address, it ends up like the Baal worship. There's no answer. It doesn't get where it needs to go. So you have the right address, the triune God, the God who created us, the God who saves us through the death of Jesus on the cross, who forgives us, the God who wants to work his power in and through us. We make our requests, don't we? We write our list. God, help me. God, save me. God, heal me. God, do something about the situation. We send it to the true God. Now, bound up with that in the Christian understanding is to get that letter home to the right spot, what do you need? A stamp. I throw this in, even addressed correctly, it doesn't get there. What's the stamp for the Christian life? Jesus Christ, his shed blood. You don't have his sacrifice there? Oh yes, God hears your prayer, will he answer? maybe by his grace, but if you want power in prayer, you need to know that he's the true and living God. You need to pray to the right God. What can a, what can a dead God do for you? Nothing. Does he satisfy your deepest desires? No, he can't help you. Well, look at what Elijah prays. This is amazing. Oh, Lord, say, that's nice. Lord is in all capital letters. It's the covenant name of God. It's a God who reaches out to his people and says, I rescued you so that you might touch the nations. What is he called? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, but his, his name is also Israel. What is his prayer request? Prove today your God in Israel, that I am your servant. Prove that I have done this 
fall at your command, at your word. Simple requests. I want everybody to know that you're the true God. I'm a servant of yours and that your word is true. Interesting thing. Hebrew names are important. We're talking about the prophet Elijah today. He's the hero. Do you know what Elijah means? Eli Yah. You hear it in his name. Yah is a shortened word for Yahweh. My God is the Lord. My God is Yahweh. What does he request in his prayer? that others might know the true God, the God that I believe in and serve. It goes on. Oh, Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people might know. What? That you, O oh Lord, are God, the true and living God. Secondly, that you brought them back to yourself. They wandered off in their ways. They didn't pray. They followed false gods. And yet we have this God who is so gracious, no matter what you've done, he forgives and loves, and he brings you back in. He dies for you. He answers your prayers. C.S. Lewis did a marvelous thing. I pray that this happens more and more here, that you keep a list of people that need to come to know God. You pray a simple prayer like Elijah prayed, God, I pray that these people might know you as the true God. Show up in their life. Draw them to yourself. He also kept a second list, a list of thanks for those who God had brought to know himself. Wonderful little, little thing. Well, when we're talking about prayer, if you want power in your prayer, you have to pray seeking God's glory. Elijah wasn't about himself. He was about God getting the credit and praise. This is a picture of that scene. I've kind of rethought it to some degree. This is an incredible scene. You had 450 Baal prophets crying out to God, cutting themselves, 400 Asherah prophets calling out to their God, no answer. One prophet of God, true prophet of God, and God hears his prayer. God listens to him. It matters. Here's the principle. When we work, we work. To only to a certain extent. When we pray... God works because there's no other explanation that the God of heaven answered it. His results are supernatural. So it's an inspiration for us to pray. And what happens when we pray? In the story of the prayers for the Baals, to the Baals, no answer. Elijah prays that simple prayer and what happens? It says... Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven, burnt up the young bull, the wood, the stones, the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. Now, what you have to understand, I had always thought in this story that this fire was lightning. I'm rethinking that. I don't know for sure, but if you keep reading the story, it was a cloudless day. There hadn't been rain for three and a half years. There wasn't a cloud in the sky but fire came down, and how did it come down? In contrast to the false prophets, the fire came immediately, right away. God wants to answer our prayers. What was the result? The result was this. When all the people saw it, they felt their faces to the ground. They cried out, the Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord, he is God. An amazing thing. Elijah's prayers were answered almost instantaneously. Well, there's power in your prayer when you pray with persistence. Elijah, God had trained him over and over, trained him to have faith in God's promises that what God says, when he says, I will show power through your prayers, it'll happen. Because God promised rain, Elijah would end up praying for rain. 
but he had no evidence of it initially other than the promise of God. So what did he do? Verse 42, Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel. He bowed low to the ground. He prayed with his face between his knees. This is sort of a picture of it. Who's the guy standing up? It's a servant of his. He's standing in the corner because he's looking on the horizon, looking at a place like this. When you stand on Mount Carmel, you're looking, if you look to the west, to the Mediterranean Sea, the, the clouds would come in there. It was a day like this one. There was no clouds until Elijah prayed. He kept telling the servant, look out, do you see anything? And it says seven times he prayed, and on the seventh time, there was a little cloud above the sea. It was the size of a man's hand, it says. Then the clouds rolled in. They were black. The heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm, and it started to rain. Now, got to put things together here. Why was there a sacrifice first? The fire had to come down and burn this sacrifice before there could be the blessing of rain. Why? God is telling us sin had to be paid for. The people had the sin of idolatry. Ahab and Jezebel would kill a guy named Naboth just to get his vineyard. They stole from him. They killed him to make it happen. There was sin all over the place, so there was a sin sacrifice that was needed. But upon God accepting that sacrifice, there could be blessing. And so Elijah prayed, and he prayed, and God answered his prayer. It says he even ran ahead of Ahab. It was about a 15-mile run. No problem. He had been empowered by the spirit of prayer. Last point. There's power in your prayer when you pray for and with others. We heard that in the epistle reading. It says, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another. Why? So you might be he healed. I'm convinced that's not only about physical healing. It's part of it. But it's also about people who are weary from life, who need someone to come along their side and just nudge them up. Again, I thank God for more people who pray for the elders praying more here. You can come up to us and get a prayer. And I pray that God raises up more people to do that as well. What are the results? Well, not only healing, not only God doing mighty things and rain coming. Look at all these results. Food and drink were provided. Dead are raised. Fire from heaven. Rain from heaven. People come to know the true God. There's healing, physical and spiritual. Because the principle is this. Little prayer, little power. Much prayer much power. Even today, Jewish people will pray this prayer. At the end of their meals, they'll say, may God in his mercy send us the prophet Elijah. You know, at the end of the day, what prayer is all about is it's about a God who wants to answer our prayers. He does. People throughout the centuries pray, oh Lord, save us. Oh Lord, Come to be with us. Oh, Lord, help us to be with you someday, forever. Did God answer prayer? I would submit he did right there. People say, why doesn't God answer? And he said, excuse me, I came for you. I died for you. I rose from the dead for you. I'm coming back to live inside of you, to prompt that spirit of God so that you might pray too, that you might see my power at work in your life so you might give me the praise. May we be people of prayer, people of power. I close with this. Wonderful hymn I came across it's entitled, Teach Me to Pray. Second verse goes like this. Power in prayer, Lord, power in prayer. 
Here mid earth's sin and sorrow and care, men lost and dying, souls in despair. Oh, give me power, power in prayer. I pray that's our heart. I pray God floods this place with people who pray in their homes, who pray in their workplaces, who aren't ashamed to say, my God is the true and living God. He answers my prayer. Amen. Let's stand. Please join with me as we pray simply to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of prayer. Help me to pray. Help me to see your power in my life and through my life. Lord, show up. Help me to see Jesus' love for me and for the world. Make me a person of prayer. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor. Grant you peace. Amen. We conclude our worship as we sing together our closing hymn. We praise the God who's worthy of it.